Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Yeshiva Torres Chaim, Torres MS, I want to welcome you to week number four, the last and final week of the Words Have Impact initiative. I want to thank TorahAnytime.com for streaming the event tonight. And as well, I want to thank Chazak and the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation for all their work in spreading the word to so many more people about this beautiful event. You know, over the last few weeks, so many people have grown in their awareness of Shmir Salashon. So many people have taken the necessary steps to grow in this important area. We said in week number one that the purpose of this whole initiative was to be mischazek ourselves, to strengthen ourselves in this area of Shmir Salashon, in which Rav Chaim Kanievsky Shlita said, will serve as a protection for ourselves and our families during this challenging time. And there's no doubt that after hearing Rabbi Shapiro, Rabbi Mansur, and Mr. Rothschild's words over the last few weeks, that all of us have truly been mischazek. Which brings us to our last and final week. And in Mirza Shem, after all that we've gained so far, and as well the final words that we're going to hear tonight from Rav Rudni, we'll be able to take this inspiration and take on something real, something concrete, in the area of Shmir Salashon to further our growth, to allow us to reach even higher levels in the area of Shmir Salashon. And it's a great covet for me at this time to ask the Rosh Hashiva Rabbi Naiman to deliver Divrei Psicha and words of introduction for tonight's speaker. Thank you, Rabbi Matzkos. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. It's a tremendous chus to be involved in talking about Shmir Salashon. Obviously, the fact that we have these four sessions just indicate to us and to all of us together that Shmir Salashon is crucial and we're impacted every day by what we talk about, what we say, and what we hear. Thank you, Rabbi Moskowitz, for the efforts you put in. It's very much appreciated. The title we named it was Words Have Impact. Rabosai, how true it is. Very true. It makes a big difference. A person can inspire and hurt and potentially kill through one's words. I want to share with you one insight which I think is crucially important when we speak about Lashon Hara and Shmir Salashon. You know, Chazal obviously take Lashon Hara very seriously, as is indicated to by various Chazal, where they talk about how if someone says Lashon Hara, he might be, if he's a Baal Lashon Hara, he was Om Haba, and various other serious Chazal which indicate how serious the Aver of Lashon Hara is. But Chazal seem to make no distinction in terms of what the person said. I can understand how serious it is if someone speaks and hurts someone tremendously, takes away his parnasa, ruins a marriage, that all makes sense. But let me give you an example. Let's say someone says, you know, Ruvain is not so careful about how he speaks to his parents. He probably should speak about his parents in a little nicer, more bechavadik way. Obviously, Ruvain's wrong for speaking that way. But that's Lashon Hara. Is that what we refer to as saying how terrible Lashon Hara is? If he's a Baal Lashon Hara like that, he doesn't get Olam Haba? Another example. Let's say someone says, you know, Shimon is a Ben Torah, but really doesn't dress as well as in the way a Ben Torah should dress. And Leia also doesn't dress the way a Bas Torah should be dressed. Lashon Hara, no question about it, bad. Shimon and Leia both doing inappropriate behaviors, but is that also part of what Chazal talk about, how Lashon Hara is so terribly bad and so injurious and, and, and terrible? Let me share with you a very perplexing Gemara in Erechin Daf Tesva Hamanala. The Gemara says, Tanya, Om Rav Lezer ben Prat Parta, Borei, Kama Godla Koach Shalashon Hara. Look how, show you how serious, how serious and how powerful is the effects of Lashon Hara. Min Nolan, Min Meraglim, from the Meraglim. Umah Mosi Shemra, Al Eitzim Vavonim. You can imagine, as we see over there by the Meraglim, what they speak about. They spoke about Eitzim Vavonim, sticks 
and stones, Eretz Yisrael, but they spoke about the land. And you see what happened, kach, right? And you see what happened, the results, that because of that, they had to spend 40 years in the Midbar, and all the people, the participants, were chay of Misa, they were killed before they went to Eretz Yisrael. So Hamosi Shemra al Chavero, so Kavachomer, so for sure if someone spreads Russian horror or says Moshe Shemra about his friend, the living human being, Alachas Kama Kama, how much more so is it, is it terrible and bad? And it seems like this Gemara is very perplexing because the Mraagam did not just speak about sticks and stones and rocks and piece of land. They spoke about Eretz Yisrael, which HaKadosh Baruch Hu had promised Avram Avinu and all his children to give to Kai Yisrael. Kai Yisrael was, went out of Mitzrayim for the purpose of being given Eretz Yisrael. And now these Meragam go and say, it's a terrible place, it's no good. What's the effect of that? That's, that talks against Hashem. It makes people lose faith and, and, and hope and excitement about HaKadosh Baruch Hu's promise to them. It's devastating. That's not Eitz and Bavonim. What's the Kav HaChomer? So the Gemara and Daf Tesla of Amabay is the next page, which speaks about many different aspects of Russian Hara. Shares with us a couple of different lines I want to share with you. Tana the Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Shmuel says, "Call me Saper Russian Hara, Magdil Avonos Keneged Shlosha Averos." If someone speaks Russian Hara, he's magnifying Averos just like the three cardinal sins of Avos Kachavim. Powerful statement. The Gemara is comparing Gosh and Hara to each one of the three sins in a certain aspect. Then the Gemara goes says, Amre, in Eretz Yisrael, they used to say, Kotel Tulisoi, he kills three people. When someone speaks Gosh and Hara, he kills three people. Horigla Mesapro, he kills the person who's speaking Gosh and Hara. Ula Makabla, the person who accepts the Gosh and Hara. Ula Omro. And to the person who says it, three people could potentially be killed. And in fact, the Das Cain and Baliatosis, one of the commentaries on the Chumash in the first part of Mitzorah, explains what does this mean. He says, Kasha Lashon Har, Mishvichas Damim. Lashon Har is worse, it's rougher, it's tougher than than, Lashen, Shvichas, than killing someone. Why? As we said, because it kills three people. And he brings an example. We know the story in Malachim. Talks in Shoftim rather, speaks about Doeg, who said Lashon Hara, about Novi Arkonim and Achimelech. And what was the result? He spoke, he spoke about how, they, how Achimelech hid David, helped David Melch out. He spoke about it to Shol, to Shol HaMelech. What was the result? Says the Daskenim, all three eventually died because of this Lashon Hara. The person who said it, Doeg, the person who was Makabalit, Shol, and the person about whom was said, Achimelech and Novi Arkonim, a whole city of Kanem, they all perished because of this Russian horror. So you see, says Das Kedem, how terrible it is, Russian horror can cause three people to die, and therefore it's just as Chamber, it's worse than Shri Hashdam. I ask you a question, my friends. The fact that you find one situation in history where three people died because of the Russian horror, does that make every Russian horror so terrible? Am I supposed to expect that when I say Rosh Hashanah about Ruvain or Shimon or Leah, that three people will die and therefore it's terrible? It happened, might happen once in who knows how long, once in a century, once in a decade, once in a thousand years. What do you prove me from Doeg and, and Novi Arkonim? So my Rebbe, Rapenach Libut, said, Pshad is, you see from here, it's not, Rosh Hashanah is not terrible because of the actual effect that it has. But if you're speaking and you're saying something which potentially, the potential impact could be that every single person, all three people will be killed, will die because of it, that's Lush and Hara. That's what's so severe and so, and so hard and so severe about Lush and Hara. Why is that? About? What's Pshat? I think the Pshat is because when a person speaks and is not concerned about the potential, as far flung as it might be, but the potential impact of potential killing three people, that means he's not machshev someone else. He's not machshev a, a Jewish, a Yiddish in the He's not machshev their life, the chashivas, the, 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 the value of their life, the value of their happiness, the value of their, of their, of their, uh, of, of being concerned about who they are 
and doesn't care about the negative impact he might have on them. It might never happen. But if it might happen, if you really care about this individual and you love him and you care about every Ben or Bas Torah, you would never say something which potentially could bring about pain or potentially death to various people. And that, that I think explains the Gemara we started off with, that the Gemara says if a person speaks about Esim Bavonim, the Mragamu spoke about Esim Bavonim, if it caused such a terrible thing, it was so impactful, Hashem punished them by Misa. Who they speak about? When you speak about people, you're naturally, it's more serious because you can realize that I might impact the people. If you speak about Esim Bavonim, the natural psychology is, and I'm talking about the land. It you know, it's more farther removed from potentially impacting people and hundreds of thousands of people. That's what the Gemara means. Therefore, it's a Kavachon. I both say we have to understand. We have to apply it to us. This is what Chazal, this is what the Torah demands of us. To be machshit, to care, to love, to be concerned for every individual, for their pain, for the value of their life. I saw a story recently. The story said about, this is our Melzer, when the Gedoli Ador in the mid-20th century, happens to be the father of Baron Cutler. He one time was sitting with his wife in a Talmud in the middle of the night, it was past Chatzos, past midnight, he's sitting in his apartment, in his house in Yerushalayim, Yer and there's a very urgent knock on the door. And without even waiting for an answer, the person barges in, opens the door, and comes in and sees Rabbi Zedalman and says, Rebbe, can I have a private meeting with you? So Rabbi so everyone's flabbergasted. There's a wife like, what, who's this guy who comes and announces it? Two o'clock in the morning, the Talmud is like looking at what's going on over here. Rabbi Zalman in his godless gets up with a smile, his normal beautiful smile, and says, come, let's go to the other room. He goes with this individual to the other room, and after a couple of minutes, they hear from the other room, Rabbi Zalman Meltzer saying, this can't be, we can't allow this, it cannot happen to a wonderful Basis role, we can't allow such things to happen. And the Rebbe said, and, you know, he was an elderly man, they were concerned, it seems like he's getting very excited. And he walked, and they were concerned about his health. He walks out of the room, and he just walks past them, as if they're not even there, ignores them, which is totally unlike Rebbe Mrs. Alma Meltzer. And he's pacing the floor back and forth and trying to, and, and, and his, you saw his, he was in pain, he was undergoing tsar, he felt so terrible. What's going on? They couldn't figure out what's going on. And he walked into another room and he was thinking, contemplating, and he goes ahead, and, and the, the, the Rebison asked his Talmud to please go into the room and find out what's going on. Is he okay? Is he healthy? Is he going to have a heart attack? Rahman al So the Talmud goes over and says, Rebbe, what's wrong? Can I help you? The Rebbe uncharacteristically says, please leave me alone now. Please leave me alone. Not now. Please leave me alone. And again, he's pacing back and forth in pain. Finally, he goes back and he's again saying, this can't be, it can't be, it can't be. And he goes back into the room finally with the town, with the person who came to visit, with the Shaila. And he says, and, and they hear him say, it'll be okay, it'll be fine. And the, the, the individual says, if the Rebbe feels that way, okay. And they walk out, and as the person is leaving the, the house, the apartment, Rabbi Shadama says, go, and Amir Hashem, in a year from now, invite me to the bris. And he comes back to his house, to, to his seat, he sits down, and he, and the Rebbe asks, what happened? What was that all about? What was causing so much distress? So he tells them, this young man was engaged to a young Bas Yisrael. And it seems that just recently, he found out from some medical experts that there's a good chance she could not have any children. And he asked me, Am I allowed to marry her? Should I break the shidduch? And my first initial response to myself was, of course, it's a suffer the right thing, we'll do it have children. We're not getting involved in the lachra, both it's not lachra maisa. But that's what, that was my initial response. But I was going back and forth and I figured it can't be, it can't be. Chazal would never, ever tolerate such pain for Abbas Yisrael. It can't be. And I said to myself, I said, everything will be okay. This is not the Torah way to, to break the shidduch. You can't cause so much tsar. That's also an Easter derisis. It's also pro prohibited to cause someone pain. And he paskin that, he, like he told the young man, Hassan, don't break the engagement. You can't cause the pain. And invite me to the bridge to the year from now. And the, and the story was that he was invited to a bridge 
a year from then. The point being on both sides, this is how a God al Hador, someone represents Torah's entirety and is a, is a manifestation of how the Torah projects and demands that we, that we think and, and feel that love and that concern for every individual. So he's so careful with his mouth, whether it's brachas or chasrom lashon hara, he realizes he's careful. What am I going to say about someone else? And, he's, and, and that's what the Torah expects from us. If you care about Chai Yisrael, you'll be careful and be concerned for far-flung potential possibilities. And therefore, all Lashon Hara, whether it's uh, talking about someone's lack of, uh, a minimal lack of Kibar of aim, or as we mentioned the other example, someone's not, maybe not dressed 100%, it still fits that category. This could cause potentially, possibly, in a far out way, could possibly cause tremendous pain or possibly even death to the people involved. And therefore, a person has to refrain, and that's why it's so serious. It's our covet to have tonight address us. The Elia Brudny, the Rashif of Mir in Brooklyn, a Chavir Moesk in America, and I know he's a very busy, his, his responsibilities to the yeshiva, to Mir Yeshiva, his responsibilities to Kai Yisrael's involvement, gives him no respite, he has no time, but he has graciously agreed to address us tonight because of the chashiva, so what it means, he wants to share with us the rechizuk and what it means to be, to, to speak about, to be careful about one's lashon, to understand more clearly how words have impact. Thank you. Rebrudnik. Shalom and bracha. I first want to express my thanks and appreciation to the yeshiva, Teres Chaim, Teres Emes of Miami, for hosting this virtual get-together dedicated to a better appreciation, a deeper appreciation of the vital role of seizing and desisting from Lashon Hara, from Achilles, gossip, and by extension, Sinas Chinam, quarreling, Achloikis, not getting along, all these foundations of Yiddishkeit, which are neglected, which are human nature is that with time they become neglected, and especially in the culture we live and in the generation we live, all around us these values are lost values. They almost don't exist. So the Torah Tzichim Chizuk always Kedai to you rejuvenate ourselves with more awareness and a deeper awareness. I want to thank the Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Sohn for his remarks, and Bechlau for being at the helm of this Moiset and inspiring, constantly inspiring with his Torah, with his Yerushalayim, and with his special had gosha, a special underlining of the concept of Yiddish Torahs and their Heretz, which is called Molotov. We're living in troubled times. The nature of living in Golas has always been, we've been in troubled times. There have been easier times, more difficult times. But for American Jewry, this is especially difficult times. It's always the first time that a pandemic with such encompass, such an encompassing pandemic and touching every part of our population, the general population, every state, every city, and also the community, uh, our community's population. Every community, every Jewish community, in every community, wherever we are, have been affected, even to the degree of much loss of life, and critical illness. Families have been turned upside down. An added dimension was the fact that the pandemic contributed, and it's all in 
to the fact that we can't for many months we couldn't and even today it's quite difficult daven as we're used to in the shul with a minion so there's a, a, the effect that it, this pandemic has had on our davening where both our leaders, our women and the governmental agencies the governors of our states have all in many cases, the yeshivas are not operating regularly. Many of our yeshivas have had to integrate virtual teaching, virtual learning. For months, our children, our youth, boys, girls, young and old, have had to study from home, not to have the advantage of a Beis HaSefer, of a yeshiva, and all that it brings, and the atmospherics that it brings. So this is a gzera within a gzera. How chasinus and simchas have been affected. So many times now, grandparents can't partake because of being careful, medically, medical medical concerns. Our young toivim weren't the same. Pesach was very much not the same. Even sukkahs wasn't the same. So it's an ace tzara hili yakov. And in a, in a time of tzara, Kalal Yisrael introspects. Kalal Yisrael goes to the sources, to the Torah Gadoisha, to find answers to how could we, what could we do to better ourselves, to find favor in our Kaddish Baruch Hu's eyes. V'hasa mi oleinu esa magefa azois, samoves azeh. So the first time Kuala Yisrael was in Golos, and it was a deep Golos, and it was a painful Golos. And the story happened when Moshe Rabbeinu found out that Dosan Vaviron reported a misdeed of his. As she explains in Pasha Shmois that it was became knowledge, that it became known that Moshe Rabbeinu killed the Mitzri in the beginning of Shmos. But Rashi says there's a deeper meaning to that. I always wondered why does Klal Yisrael suffer? Why does Klal Yisrael have to go such a bitter gulls? But if these two people, Dosan and Aviram, spoke Lash and Hara, they revealed my identity. And I had to run from, from Mitzrayim. I had to run to the Midbar because I was unsafe, because power wanted to kill me. So now I understand. If there's Lashon Hara, if there's Bali Lashon Hara in Kal Yisrael, I understand that Kal Yisrael has to suffer. And the question arises. The question was, why does Kal Yisrael suffer even more than others? So the answer is because there are two people in Kali Yisrael that speak Lashon Hara. There are many people that speak Lashon Hara. All the nations around, the, all the nations of the world don't even have a mitzvah of speaking Lashon Hara. It's not in the seven mitzvahs commanded to the Bnei Noyach. And we see now at times the politicians, the politics, the, 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 the political wars, the media. I mean, Lashon Hara... Is, is 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 just rampant all over our culture, all our over our civilization. So Kalal Yisrael, because we have lashon hara, we suffer more. But the answer is yes. Because we're different. Mika, the Rebbeinu Shalom, the Gemara teaches us the Rebbeinu Shalom in his tefillin, as the pasuk, Umika Amcha Yisrael Goya Chad Baaretz. We have an hour fill in Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. The Rebbeinu Shloinim in his fill in has Mika Amcha Yisrael, Goy Echad Baharetz. Goy Echad means a unified nation, an entity, a family. Rak Eschem Yodati Mikol Mishpecha Yisro Adama. Kral Yisrael is a family. We're all related. We're all Achim. Many times the Torah exhorts us to lend money, to look out for others. 
is because he's your achicha. Ultimately, we're all three brothers. Quality souls. A, 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 a very large family emanating from our three patriarchs, from our three avos, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. So, Loshon Hara, Gasset, Rechilus, which breathes Sinas Chinam, which breathes Machloikis, arguments, quarrels, all that undermines the, uni- the unity of Klal Yisrael, the Achtus of Klal Yisrael. And if we become splintered, and we're not a Goy Echad, we lose our whole claim to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's choosing us of all the other nations, the minute we're not unified, the minute we're splintered, even families, even friends, even teenagers, and even younger, the minute we're not achdus, then that opens us up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's wrath, Rachman al-Islam, because that's not what he wants from us. He wants unity. Achva. Ahava. So that's Ochei Noida Adava. So in a time of trial and tribulation, in a time of Gzeva, in a time when there's Mida Sadin, and there's so much pain out there, First and foremost, we have to think about our achdus. Are we the achdus? First of all, are we all the achdus with each other? More than that, do we feel a sense of unity with Jews all over? We're in our community, but what about do we feel attached? Do we feel unified with Yidin in the north and in the west? in the Midwest, and in the Southwest, in all our communities, and this is the United States. And what about our brothers in Eretz Yisrael? That in addition to having to cope with the pandemic, with COVID, they still have their enemies on the North and the enemies in the South. And there are missiles, just two days ago, there were missiles fired in the South. And another time there are missiles fired in the North. And it's a, a constant state of siege. Are we nice of oil with them? Do we empathize with them? Do we feel that they're ours? They're our brothers. They're our sisters. Okay, no dad over. There's a Pasuk in Sefer Hosea. Where the Rabbi Shalom tells the Navi, Klal Yisrael at the time that a lot of Avayas unfortunately served a lot of idols and did Avodah Zorah. This is Malchus Yisrael in Bayis Rishon. But yet the Navi was told by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Chavur Atzavi Mephraim. Yes, they do Avodah Zorah, but they're unified. They're doing Aveiros, but they have unity between them. Hanachlo. I'm not going to punish them as long as they're unified. They'll win wars, and I'll give them siyata deshmaya with the hope that eventually they'll do tshuva. But the pasuk, this is in capital Dalit. In capital Yud, there's another pasuk. Cholak libam. But when they come, the achdus, they lose their achdus. They become not unified. They become splintered. Ato Yesham. That's when I'm going to punish them, Achlon al even for the Averis that till now I didn't punish them. And the Chazal say that the reason we went to Golis is because we lost the Mida of Shalom and we held on to Machloikas, to fights. And therefore, he, Abraham Yisraelim told, took us to nations she'en yodim shalom. Because the Pasuk says in Eichah that I went to Golos v'atiznach mi shalom nafshi. Nashisi toiva. And that brings you to mind that in the times we're living, we're living in a country, such a blessed country, a democratic, a democratic country, a country with such benevolence and chesed. 
And yet, look what happened to our country. The partisanship, the hostility between different ideological views. One could disagree without being an enemy. One could disagree without name-calling. One could disagree without spewing venom on his opponent. And on both sides, both sides of the political spectrum, the dialogue, the language is so bitter, so hateful, so intolerant. It definitely rubs off on our culture, on our people. Our youth is exposed to this. You don't have to be anything more than a casual, a casual viewer of the news, a casual observer of the, of the political scene in this country to see how far from Shalom and Achtos the civilization in which we're living is. So how much more difficult it's for us to rise to our goy echad ba'aretz. And that compels us to learning the halachas, to learning the musr, the holy Chafetz Chaim's heritage. The holy Chafetz Chaim left us such a legacy. So our rebellion, our morals, our Rosh Hashivas, our Menalos, Menalim, they're all begging us to rise above pettiness. And it all begins in school. At least in a classroom there should be Achdos. In an auditorium and in a dining room there should be Achdos. At home there should be Achdos. In shul there should be Achdos. And we be zeichet to a hanach loy, chavur Ephraim. When Ephraim is attached, when Am Yisrael are like goy echad ba'oretz, Hakadosh Baruch Hu rescinds his gezeros, and the midas arachamim overpowers the midas adin. We all know. From the Chazal Akdoshim, from Pikeyavos, others, Derecheretz Kod Molotoyra. Derecheretz, it comes ahead of, of Torah. The foundation on which Torah is built is a foundation of Derecheretz. The Medrash brings a beautiful story about Derecheretz and the Torah. There was an Amoira. One of the great Rabbanim in the times of the Gemara, in the times of the Talmud. His name was Rav Yanai. Those of you that already have the privilege of learning Gemara, you come across Rav Yanai's statements in the Gemara. Rav Yanai once invited a rabbinic looking person to him for lunch. He met this person and uh, and this person appeared as a rabbi and brought him in for lunch. But when he started conversing with him, he saw that the man was ignorant of any Torah knowledge. He didn't know Gemari, he didn't know Mishnayis, he didn't know Chumash, he didn't know Rashi, he didn't know Tanakh, he didn't know Dinim, unfortunately. And finally, he didn't even know how to bench. He didn't even know how to daven and read. And yet he appeared, appeared rabbinic. Rav Yanai initially got very angry that he was an imposter. And, and how does a person who is so empty of knowledge of Torah appear like a rabbi? But afterwards, they had a whole conversation, and the person answered Rav Yanai. That is Rav Yanai's responsibility to see to it that all the people living in his town are, are learned in Torah. Finally, Rav Yanai is the gentleman. What special 
characteristics and attributes that you have that I mistook you for a rabbinic figure. It was, it's not that Rabbi Yanai was caught up with the person's garb or the way he presented. Rabbi Yanai saw an inner glow, an inner glow of Torah in this person. And, and he can't understand. The man doesn't know anything. He doesn't, he's, he's, he's totally ignorant. So the person answered Rabbi Yanai as, Rabbi Yanai as follows. A very plain person. But I come to tell you that I have two things that I strive to be perfect in. A, I've never heard gossip or something negative said by one person about another person and I brought that information back. In other words, I never saw negativity, never heard negativity, and I brought it back. In other words, I never was, I never did rechilos. I never did Lashon Ara. Never. A second thing is that I never saw people in a dispute, argument, that had the potential to get out of hand and to lead to machlokas, to lead to a rivalry which is not healthy, to cause friction among people. I never allowed that to fester. I didn't move away from the situation till I resolved it favorably for both sides and there was complete shalom and there was complete peace. Which in essence, this man was echoing the words that we say in Davning and Shabbos, Mio Isha Chafetz Chaim, Oyev Yom and Liroiz Toiv, Nitzar L'Shoyne Chameira, watch your tongue from saying something evil, Usfasecha, and your lips Medaber Mirma. And afterwards, Sumi Rav, Vasei Tov, keep away from evil and do only good. Bakesh Shalom Veratfei. Always seek peace for yourself and for everybody that you know. So when he told this to Rav Yanai, Rav Yanai says, Oh, if you're such so great in the mid of the Recheretz, if you're such excellence in Derech Eretz, then I have no question why I mistook your glow for a rabbinic glow, for a glow of Torah, for a glow of scholarship. Because Derech Eretz Kodma la Torah Fchav Vav Deres Derech Eretz preceded the Torah 26 generations. Because it says by Adam Arishan as Derech and only afterwards Eitz Achayim. And if you know history, from Adam till Moshe Rabbeinu, the generation of Torah, were 26 generations. All those 26 generations were Derech Eretz. They didn't have a Torah. They didn't, Torah wasn't codified. They didn't get the Torah yet. But they served Hashem from Derech Eretz, from core Jewish values, Jewish compassion. Jewish humility, the Jewish love for others. That's what kept us going for 26 generations before we got the Torah. So if someone has that, if someone excels in that, that's always going to be a catalyst that eventually that person is going to come to Torah. He'll understand Torah. He'll be able to dwell deeper in Torah, he'll remember Torah, he'll recall the Torah that he's learned. Because the seeds of Torah learning, of Torah knowledge, is the seeds of Midas Torah and the Recheres, the Recheres called Mother Torah. The Vilna Goyen has a Sefer on Chumash. It's called that Deris Eliyon. He brings from Chazal in Parshas Devorim that there are five 
infiltrations of alien influences of the nations of the earth that have infiltrated the fabric of Am Yisrael throughout the ages. The concept of Erev Rav. There are five different elements of Erev Rav that infiltrated Am Yisrael. Which means that without the pure lineage that we carry from Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, these behaviors that he's enumerating don't behoof us. But if we find that in Klal Yisrael, among the Jewish people, it's something that was brought into our nation from alien, from alien influences, from an Erev Rav, that infiltrated our nation. And he goes through. The first one is Machlokes of Lashon Hora, not getting along, Sinas Chinon, that's something very far, foreign to us. Our Ovis Agdoshin, Avrom Yitzchak and Yankov had no, no part in such misbehavior. So if we see it, and unfortunately we see it rampant, it's coming from infiltration of foreign, of foreign influences over the millennia. We've been exposed to influences that are foreign to us, so we have elements of Erev Rav. And he goes through other inappropriate behaviors. And he says the worst and the most difficult of all of them is Lashon Hara and Rechilus, Lashon Hara and Sinas Chinam. And that is a legacy left to us throughout the ages by the Erev Rav of Amalek. Amalek is the first nation that started up with us, Rashi's Goyim Amalek, and Amalek is the first nation after the Torah was given and the miracles of Harsinai and Yamsuf that we build against HaKadosh Baruch Hu, their influence has left us with this struggle to avoid Machloikas and to avoid Lashon Har and Achilus. And he goes on and he says, Ve'en ben David ba. The final redemption of Mashiach ben David will not occur till this Erev Rav will be Yichlum Yisrael, will be eradicated from the Jewish people. And he says, working against Machloikas and working against Lashon Hara and working against Sinas Chinam is a manifestation of Timche Ezecher Amalek. We can't go out today and hold wars with weapons against Amalek. We don't know who Amalek is, and we don't have the ability to go wage wars. We're living in a foreign country, and we don't have the ability to go out and wage war till Mashiach comes. But the war has to be fighting the concept, creating within us an awareness, spreading the word, how destructive Lashon Hara is, what risks it poses to the safety of Am Yisrael, to the spiritual safety and to the material safety, to the physical welfare and to the spiritual welfare of Am Yisrael. And as we're struggling to improve ourselves, which is the, nation of, which is the nature of tonight's get-together, to improve ourselves and to learn how to find methods and ways from improvement to sustainable improvement and to become more in keeping with Mika Amcha Yisrael Goya Chod Ba'oretz we're eliminating the influence of the Erev Rav of Amalek among the Jewish people and that's Timcha Ezecher Amalek eradicate even the memory of Amalek. 
It's amazing to think by improving or excelling in Shmira Salasha, one is actually purifying Klal Yisrael from the influence of Amalek. So let's all daven and ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That as we gather and undertake this improvement, this tshuva, in Shmir Sadibur, in Shmir Saloshim, in Habas Yisrael, in Vahavta Lareach Ekemocha, in Losisna Esachicha Dovavecha, we're going to be Makari of the Geula. We're going to help eradicate this disease, this pandemic, this COVID that's brought so much pain to Am Yisrael among all the other nations of the world. But by us, it's brought the double pain that it's been destructive in a very spiritual way. Having to cope with the modifications in Torah and Tefillah has hurt us so badly spiritually. Through, through this tshuva, through this chizuk. We should to a Yeshua from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we should all be Zaycha, Be'ezer Hashem, to see the redemption of Am Yisrael. V'sechezeno e'ineinu b'shuvcha l'tziyo e'n Thank you.